Hello and welcome. This is my first uh, screen capture video that I'm going to do to assist you in Max 7. I'm sure you've been following my instructional articles and the patches I've uploaded, but I thought that for some of you it will be of great benefit to actually see me work through some problems and I hope to do this periodically. It takes quite a bit more effort and time, but Hopefully the payoff will be there, so please let me know in the comments if you appreciate this kind of um, a tutorial, and I'll try and do more of them in the future. So I thought to start with, um, I'll start at a fairly basic level, because most of my material is oriented towards beginners and intermediate level Max users, I'd have to say, and all of this is informed by my background in computer programming and project management. So I tend towards a very structured approach, which is not always how people approach a visual uh, language like Max. So um, I like comments uh, because, um, here we go, hard to speak and type at the same time. I need to get multitasking sorted. So a structured approach includes commenting your patches so that you can understand them. It doesn't mean commenting every little thing, but just uh, where you need to. It involves doing things like labeling all of, your, all of your patches and giving them appropriate names. So let's just start with that, will we? Um, I'm gonna create a very simple patch that just does stereo audio output but this will help me um, illustrate and explain some of the key concepts. So, uh, first of all, let me, let me just fancy this up a bit, make it bold, make that bigger, uh, give it some sort of color. I like green, green is nice and safe. Uh, so, this patcher is gonna be called Audio Output, so I'm gonna put the name of it right at the top and I'm gonna save it immediately using that name. I'm going to save it to the desktop for convenience. Audio output. But that's not really a great idea. What you should do is create a folder uh, or a directory for every new project. Save all your files in that one place. It will really help you uh, to keep organized. But I'm going to do things slightly differently just because I'm giving a tutorial. So the idea here is to um, in the next uh, 15 minutes or how long it's going to take me, show you how to create an abstraction for stereo audio output. Um, not something that maybe needs this sort of uh, approach, but it can't hurt. And so the idea is um, that if I have a, a cycle tilde object um, at a certain frequency and I want to send it to my output, um, I should be able to do that quite easily. Send it to both channels of the output. Lock the patcher. Pull down my volume. Turn it on. There we go. Nice simple sine wave. Nothing too exciting. Um, but there's other stuff I probably want to add to this to use time and time again. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put all of it inside a sub patcher. So, um, for convenience, I will create, I'm going to add this stuff, move this out of here, create a new patcher. Blow my head off temporarily because it was connected to the DAC. Uh, this illustrates um, sort of a principle that, that I'm going to come back to in a moment. I'll just save this as uh, main. So this is my main patcher. And it's going to actually call a sub patcher to do all the dirty work for it. And so um, I've just got both of them together here. Right, so audio output. What do we want to see with audio output? Well, first of all, we have our choice of easy DAC. Whoops. Or DAC tilde. Easy DAC tilde or DAC tilde. And the nice thing about EasyDAC is you can turn it on and off um, by clicking on it. And you have a visual representation of that, if that's important to you. However, 
every UI object you use, every user interface object, which is to say one that has a visual representation that writes to the screen, takes more CPU, it takes more resources, and will eventually slow down Macs or create issues. Now, it certainly won't in a patcher this simple, but in the long run, it will. So here's a key takeaway. Only use UI objects when you need them. Don't use them for simple functions like turning the DAC on and off. Um, as a rule, I would never do that because DAC tilde is actually a lot more flexible. You can specify, um, if you use the right numbers, you can specify how many outputs you want. For example, now we have four output channels. Um, we can do something like double click on it to get our audio status window, which I know you can get through the menu, but this is convenient. It's a very convenient way to get to it. So I can see I'm running a Fireface or any Fireface device at the moment at 44.1 uh, hertz, uh, kilohertz is enough, 44.1 kilohertz. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna use an easy DAC, I'm just gonna use this. And to get, before I ever hit stereo output, I always want to control the volume um, because I wanna protect my equipment, I wanna protect my ears from sudden volume spikes. And there's any number of ways of doing this in Max. You could set up um, a simple amplitude multiplier with a slider, and then and then go from there or you can use one of the very handy built-in objects and this is a live gain tilde so it's in the live subset of objects that were created for max for live for integration um, with um, ableton live but you can use them anywhere you like and i actually like this object a lot because it combines three functions that otherwise we'd have to build for ourselves. First of all, it is a fader. Um, it's a stereo fader, but it's in decibels. If you can see these little numbers down here and decibels are more representative of how we hear volume. It's sort of a psychoacoustic measure. Uh, technically it isn't, but it's close enough to a psychoacoustic measure. Um, we tend to hear more or less in a logarithmic scale of volume and decibels expresses that. And furthermore, we actually have a meter in here. So so um, perhaps if I um, was to put my cycle tilde back with my arbitrary, let's make it 222 hertz, uh, arbitrary. And let's send it to both inputs and turn on. If I turn on the DAC, my ear gets blown out again because um, if I go back to main, I'm actually turning on this DAC as well. Time to get rid of this, I think. There we go. Save that. Right. Um, so here you see we have uh, levels. Uh, we have a stereo control all in one. It's very handy. So the thing to do to get sound out of this is, it can be hard to see these at the bottom, but hook up the first two to our DAC because that's the left and right channel output. The others uh, report on other attributes of this, of this uh, object. Um, while I'm thinking of attributes, I can go into the inspector and turn off the bit that says live gain at the top. We don't really care <laughs> what it's called. In fact, I don't really even wanna see the number at the bottom. I just want a nice simple display like this. And um, yeah, so this is now kind of handy. We can get our we can get our stereo output control. Now, when this first loads, it's gonna actually load at full volume because this interface object defaults to zero dB. I don't want that at all. I want it to default to its minimal setting, which is minus 70. How do we know that? Well, we can look at the inspector and it says the display range in dB is minus 70 to six, uh, floating point numbers here, minus 70 to six. Now you can set that even quieter if you want. You could set the minimal to uh, the minimal end of the range to minus 120 if you wanted to. And if you're in a very quiet recording studio and you think you're gonna get that much dynamic range, then more power to you. But as you can maybe hear from this recording, I'm in my living room, my um my sort of home studio and i can tell you i do not have 120 decibels of dynamic range in here uh, especially not when the cat's in the room but even with the computer uh, humming away 70 is more than enough 
Okay, what else might we want in an audio output? Well, this is a nice visualization of, I suppose, the volume, but it doesn't really tell us anything about the waveform. Um, I enjoy using um, plot tilde. Uh, so I'm going to label it up here, and then I'm going to create the object. Plot tilde is extremely versatile and extremely hard to set up correctly. Um, here's a hint. Use prototypes. Yes, what are prototypes? Well, there are so many different parameters here um, that could possibly... Actually, let's look at the help for that. Right, here's the help on plot tilde. Um, it's got a lot of tabs. That's a sure sign that this is a complicated uh, object. These are all the messages um, that you can send it. That's quite a few. And a lot of them control just the visual aspect, what it appears like, what it looks like. So um, what they, what um, Max has come up with this system whereby we can use prototypes. Now, I want to make sure that you can actually see this in my screen capture. So prototype saw, it goes off the screen a little bit, does it? Probably it does, but you can see the first couple. I'm going to choose audio scope light. Now what this does, a prototype applies a whole group of messages at one time. It's a handy way of saving them um, and applying them all together to style your objects. And what's more is that once it's applied, this will be remembered in this patcher. Not all messages and attributes are necessarily remembered by objects. Now, I don't know if this could be called a bug or just a feature of how Max works, but I like being really certain that um, I specify any that I want um, for sure. So let's see this in just a moment. First of all, I'll connect this up. So I'll take the left channel coming in and I'll put it there so we have some kind of a waveform. And because I chose 222, it doesn't subdivide nicely. If I chose 200, boom, there you go. It actually happens to sync up with the sampling rate nicer. And so we get a steady waveform, which is misleading, of course, because this is dynamic. Uh, what we saw a moment ago, the flickering was actually more accurate in, in a sense. But this is easier to look at. <laughs> Now I can change uh, some of the additional attributes here of plot, and, and that's just done by, by sending it messages. So um, again, if we went go and look at the help, which we will need to because no one's going to remember all these, uh, you can define color, filter, uh, grid, origin, the thickness. Oh, let's do thickness. Okay, so I actually do like the line to be slightly thicker. So if I do define thickness, uh, two as a float and send that there to the plot tilde so that makes a slightly bolder line and there's a lot more things I might want to change in order to standardize this to sort of a color set and a theme that I uh, want to use over and over again to give my objects a consistent look and feel so this changes the color it changes actually the grid color and the grid origin color to be the same as the background, so they disappear into the background. And so this creates just a nice, a nice display. Um, I don't need those grid lines, you know, because I'm not measuring anything here. It's just to show us that we have a waveform. I like looking at waveforms. It's very good practice to get to know what sounds look like. Um, it's it's actually um, a handy skill load bang I want to use to make sure that every time the patcher loads this gets sent into the object and now I'm starting if I save my work I'm starting to develop like my own little my own little um output with look and feel uh my own little audio output oh yeah I need to get sound into this don't I well some inlets will do that Because in reality, I don't want this to be a cycle. That's just for us testing. I actually want um, inlets for the signals, something like that. Notice how this doesn't update. It still shows us that sine wave that no longer exists. I find that kind of weird. Um, that's just how things work sometimes. 
So um, audio inputs L and R. And another thing I'm going to want to do here is is um, enable our enable messages to our our DAC itself. So I'll just give us another inlet here. Comment it. I always like commenting all of these um, inlets and outlets so that you know what they do and don't forget. So. So the first one then will be messages for the DAC. Our second inlet will be the left audio input and our third inlet will be the right audio input. Maybe we should go and make this work. Let's go and make this work. So let's go back to main and we have our cycle object. Give us more room. Turn off the DAC for now. And we are gonna be using audio output. So because we created this patcher, it acts like any other max object. It shows us our three inlets just fine. So let's go ahead and connect up to the left and right with our cycle. And let's put a toggle here to send messages to our DAC to turn it on and off. So if I turn down my volume, let's see if this works. I can turn on. Sure enough, that works. But we're not getting the full value out of our abstraction because where's all our audio, where's our, our audio objects are here, but our interface objects are not here. We cannot see them. We cannot see the plot. We cannot see this nice fader. In order to do that, we have to implement presentation mode. So if you go down here, you can see there is an easel like icon. You click it and you see your presentation mode. It's completely blank and empty at the moment. So we need to select objects and tell them to add to presentation mode. So we can right click or command click or whatever it is. If you don't have um, a two button mouse, if you don't have a two button mouse, you should you should probably get one. But uh, anyhow, <laughs> that's sort of beside the point, isn't it? So this has been added to the presentation mode. It has a strange sort of pink color uh, outline to tell us that. We also want the fader, um, our live gain tilde, to be added to presentation mode. The other way of doing this is simply to go to the inspector and choose include in presentation like that. That's the other way of doing it. So you go back here. Yep. We check our presentation mode. There's our objects. Now we can independently size and move these in this mode and it does not affect the other mode. Let's do that. And I'm moving them to the top left because that is what you want to do. That's where the interface is going to be taken from. So you could do it this way. You may do it this way. I don't know. What do you like? Something like that. So it hasn't changed these positions here. Now in order for this to work, well, let's just see. Let's just try it out, shall we? Go back to main. Now, instead of using our object like this as an abstraction, we could, um, or vice versa, instead of using the abstraction as an object like this, we can instead use a B patcher. So start new object, call it B patcher and wonder why it's called B patcher. Why isn't it called V for visual patcher or something? I don't know. It gives us what looks empty and is easy to kind of lose because it's got a very narrow like half pixel or something blue, light blue uh, border around it. And in here we can specify the file and we can specify it any number of ways. We can actually click and drag um, right into here or we could use our inspector and choose the patcher file audio output so we choose the patcher file and this is what it looks like it's going to show us the visual view of that patcher okay and it's got one 
two, three inlets as we expect. So we can connect up to this. So I'm going to delete this version entirely. Connect up here as before. And this abstraction works identically to before, but in a B patcher, not instantiated just as a simple object. And it shows us the visuals. Not the visuals we want to see, however, because I don't think our, you know, we want to see all the guts of our patcher here. Flip back again to the abstraction. We need to tell it one more thing. If you right click anywhere here on the background and you pull up the inspector window, so if you, if you right click on the patcher itself, not on any object in the patcher, you get this window. And somewhere here, um, it says open in presentation. That's what you want to check. Okay. Open in presentation. It's under view in, in your inspector. And then we can close that up again. Now what will happen is every time this opens in Max, it will open in presentation mode. Save it. Close it. Let's check that out. I'm going to reopen the file from my desktop. It opens in presentation mode. Now you can always get back to patching mode simply, but this is what we want so that when we use it in our main patcher, which we already did, you can now see, if I can unlock that eventually, you can now see well, I can resize this much smaller and it's showing us the presentation view like that. So this is pretty well what we want. We want uh, a consistent audio interface that we can use in any of our programs from now on simply by embedding this B patcher. And we don't need to worry about the details of what's going on in here. Um, if I lock the patch, I can turn it on. I can turn up the volume. I can turn up my master volume as well. Of course, they both need to be up, so I can do it like this. Turn it off. There we go. So it works. Um, the controls work through the B patcher and contribute to this main patch, which I guess I could label as well. Um, let me just, for convenience, uh, copy this out here. Oh, yeah, I'll just call it main in sort of similar style as before. So here's our main patch. Now, tiny little thing. If we're designing presentation mode views, we're doing it for the end user of our program. That could be us in performance. It could be us when we don't want to see all the guts, all the patch cables, all the details of our patcher. It could be someone else. We could be writing um, performance in instruments or algorithmic composition tools or audio filters and FX for other people. So presentation mode is very, very handy for all of that. Um, there's a lot you can do with it. In fact, uh, you can design fully professional looking plugins using presentation mode. It takes a lot of work to get that far, but um, for what we're doing right now, it's, uh, it's, it's darn handy. So this program itself, the main program, we also want a presentation view. So we could take our toggle. Um, maybe we'll give it a label. And we'll also take the audio output and we'll add all of those to presentation so that this is what the main program looks like, okay? So if I lock it, uh, you can see now, hopefully it's clear that this is a great way to build up a complicated program with small building blocks. I hope um, 
I hope that it's an approach that you take because abstractions save you time and work. They also prevent error because once you have the audio output working with as many features as you want, I mean, this is only a simple example, you just don't need to reinvent that wheel. You just need to roll out the wheel and put new tires on it every time. So I think that's enough for one for one screencast. I've basically just gone through how to use abstractions as B patchers, how to use them visually, and some of the advantages of that. And along the way, I've shown you a few uh, useful objects. Um, and yeah, that's not a bad place to stop. If you want to check out on my Patreon um, uh, site, I have a code and a walkthrough of designing an audio output for my Veer suite. Thanks for watching. My name is Robin, and I hope to see you again.